From the high desert and the great American Southwest, I bid you all good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be in the world's time zones. All covered like a blanket by this program, Midnight in the Desert. I'm Art Bell, and it's a joy to be here. I'm going to uh, foray tonight that I'm not used to. We're going to talk about werewolves. I don't frequently talk about werewolves well with one exception all right so anyway uh werewolves coming up with uh with our guest uh linda actually linda godfrey and i'm looking forward to that the rules of the program are so simple uh no bad language and only one call per show a couple of news items and then a shock for you Donald Trump signed the pledge. He pledges that no matter who the Republican nominee is, uh, he will support him. So I guess he's to the point now where he figures he's so number one that he's going to be the nominee, so why not? Right? Because there were threats looming if he didn't do that. And threats for the Republican Party, too. Tom Brady also having a good day. He will start in the game uh, because he beat the league, Roger Goodell. Roger Goodell will not be at the beginning of the game. Well, probably because he figures the crowd will boo him. So Trump signs, Brady plays. And that's about the as good as the news gets. Oh, well, there is sort of one different news story. Uh, this, again, comes from uh, a website that I visit regularly. Uh, it, uh, it gives a per- perfectly, uh, I would say, rational and scientific explanation. It explains autoscopic phenomena. That means, like, you know, out-of-body, right? Or doppelganger encounters. These explanations discard the notion of an actual soul becoming temporarily separated from the human body and instead insisting it's nothing more than powerful hallucination invented by the brain. Now, this is such bunk. Anyway, let me read it. Frankly, the... A uh, possibility that our brains are powerful enough to cause us to hallucinate leaving our body is even more unnerving than simply believing the soul can travel. Discussions on subjects like these lead to wondering how come some people can believe in the paranormal at all. Well, apparently the answer lies in the way some people process things. This really gets bad. Intuitive thinkers generally tend toward believing in things like UFOs and ghosts and other supernatural phenomena, which honestly sounds like a vaguely insulting way to say that intuitive thinkers are kind of dumb. That's absolutely awful. (laughs) And really, really, really untrue. Oh, yeah, one more item. This is pretty freaky, actually. Scientists uh, in Russia, actually in Kazakhstan, are puzzled because it seems 60,000 antelopes have died. It is a mass die-off, not of a species, but damn close, you know, in a way. Can you imagine that 60,000 antelopes got sick and just keeled over? It is, well, it is a die-off. And they have no idea why. But the story caught my eye because it made me wonder if there could be someday. I mean, how many die-offs have we seen, huh? Things from the sea, 
beaching themselves, birds crashing to the ground for no reason that we can figure out, bees committing virtual suicide. I wonder if one day Mother Nature doesn't say, you know, we need a balance. And right now it's tipped toward Earth having problems with so many humans. Let's have a die-off. Now, how would that come? I don't know. Maybe, you know, just a little thing, like a germ or a bacterium of some sort or who knows. But, I mean, if there can be these die-offs that we continually see in the animal world around us, then it seems to me that we should always be on lookout for all the little little things that at first don't seem a big problem. Anyway, this uh, is... Oh, one more thing, the shock. <laughs> um, if that all wasn't shocking enough. Tomorrow night. Now, some of you know and some of you don't know, but a number of years ago, on another show in another galaxy, I interviewed the most amazing guy whose name was Mike Markham. Now, I affectionately dubbed him, and it stuck, really stuck, Madman Markham. I called him Madman because of, well, frankly, some of the things he did. Well, I'm talking with Madman, and he'll be here tomorrow night. Madman has agreed to come back on the radio. This is not a guy who likes the limelight. Not a guy who likes the limelight at all. Uh, and for a guy who doesn't like the limelight, it might be recalled he gave out on the air his phone number and address. <laughs> He's not there anymore. So uh, anyway, uh, the ensuing four days, I think he got no sleep. He got a bunch of money in the mail. The world went nuts. Madman Markham, back on this program, no, on this program for the first time tomorrow night. And I know that news is going to quickly go far and wide. Madman has not been interviewed. And I might add, although I'm not going to give it away, Madman has big plans. He's got big works underway. He's done amazing things since we talked to him. So, there you have it. Coming up, Fortean investigator and former teacher... Newspaper journalist Linda S. Godfrey is the author of 16 books on strange creatures, people, and places, too, including The Beast of Bray Road. you got to love that name, The Beast of Bray Road. Weird Wisconsin, Weird Michigan, Real Wolf Men, True Encounters in Modern America, and her most recent, American Monsters, A History of Monster Lore Legends, and sightings in America. She has been a guest on many national uh, uh, television and radio shows. She's uh, an amazing woman. I mean, first of all, when have you ever heard of a woman talking about werewolves? Lots of TV and radio. She is also a commercial and fine artist. She illustrates many of her own books lives in southeast Wisconsin on the edge of the cryptid pact, um, what is this, Kettle um, Moraine State Forest, I hope that's right, with her husband, dog, and youngest son. Her next book is forthcoming in 2016 from Tarcher Penguin Books and will explore the even stranger side of strange creatures' sightings. So, a strange creature sightings, and, and there are plenty of those. So, coming up, Linda Godfrey, and we're going to talk werewolves. I know my wife has her ear plastered to the, uh, the phone at home, listening to this show, Werewolves. Want to take a ride? 
Your conductor, Art Bell, will punch your ticket when you call 1-952-CALL-ART. That's 1-952-225-5278. That's it. All right, now comes Linda Godfrey. We originally were going to have her on uh, on Skype, uh, but our Skype connection was bad, bad, bad. And so uh, here we are on the phone, and she sounds great anyway. Linda Godfrey, hello. Hello. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Um, so, Linda, um, I am fascinated uh, by werewolves. Um, and and so the, the first question I actually have to ask you is, um, are werewolves real? No. <laughs> In my opinion, not the traditional, usual oh, way that people believe in werewolves. Not the every corpuscle, every atom of the body, the DNA changing and the bone growing and the Jack Nicholson fur sprouting out of the face and all of those changes that you see in Hollywood. Most of that is pure Hollywood, special effects, things made up, and a really new mythology even created um, back in the, the, early, the beginning of the 20th century when all those monster movies, those black and white wonderful monster movies, The Wolfman, Lon Chaney, were being made, um, these mythologies about being bitten and then turning into a werewolf, um, the werewolf coming out only in the full moon, all those kinds of things, the physical, completely physical transformation, um, I don't believe it, and I, I say that pretty clearly in, in every book. Oh, but... come on, Linda, my <laughs> wife dr- dragged me to see Twilight, I know, I, so, I know what a werewolf is. <laughs> And those, the Twilight Wolves, are the least possible of them all. They don't make good boyfriends. You know, they take you out to the woods. You have to eat really terrible food. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's it's just not the way it is. And and I don't really mean to make light of it because I know many people who've had really terrifying. There's something real. I mean, what I write about is not a non-existent fictional thing. Oh, wait, it's wait, real. wait, wait, wait. Now you're going the other way. I well, say no. I ask, are werewolves real? And and you say, no, not totally a, crushing a, the entire interview, probably. And <laughs> and now and now, not less than a minute later, we're talking about people who have had terrifying experiences with animals that, that that you're talking about may be werewolves. They look like werewolves. Well, if they look like one and bite like one, then they must be one. Well, what people say is, if there was such a thing as werewolves this would be it because they look like except when you think about it um, when most people picture a werewolf they're thinking of something that looks at least part human you know at at least with some trace of humanity really I'd say 90% of the reports that people send to me um, don't have any sort of humanity in them except they walk upright but they're still on their little dog feet you know with the hawk up off the ground. They're not walking flat-footed like humans. Um, they don't have any human characteristics, really, um, although there's another subset that, that do. We can get into that later. It gets a Well, then, what, what are they like, really? Are they? Would you describe them more like some sort of canine uh, variation or what? Well, that's what I thought for a very long time, and I still, when I look at my reports, I have to say probably at least 90% of them um, show nothing more than what could be some kind of large adaptation of a timber wolf with um, slightly elongated paws. That's the only thing that's really different than most of them. But they have the natural canine color of eye shine, which is the yellow, yellow, green. Right. They have the shaggy fur. They have the long snout. They have big fangs. They have pointy ears on top of their heads. Uh, they they snarl and growl. And most the interesting thing is that most of the time, I mean, they can chase cars, chase people. People feel that they're going to be eaten instantly. And then at the last second, what they do is they run off into the woods or the cornfield or whatever cover is near them, and it ends that way, you know, so that's that's unusual. And there are a few other things about them, but what, just to look them, I've said for a long time, if you found a dead one, 
you would just say there's a kind of weird looking really big wolfish looking dog lying there dead all right but you wouldn't you wouldn't see a human all right this brings another question to mind then a number of years Mm -hmm. ago and even fairly recently linda there have been reports of what people down south call a chupacabra now what you're describing Mm -hmm. sounds a Sounds damn close to a chupacabra, to be honest with you. Are you, you're obviously, you would be aware of the chupacabra. Any thoughts? Yeah, um, I think that they're actually, and now we're talking about the original Puerto Rican style chupacabra, um, not the recent Texas blue dog or the droned um, raccoons that people take mistake for, for chupacabra. But, okay, I'm so not sure I could these, make the distinction, but okay. Well, they're the ones that were reported in um, Puerto Rico and parts of Mexico and even up into Texas, uh, where the, the with all of the huge mutilations and um, the the um, goats were having their blood drained, that sort of thing. Yes. And that's actually what the name means. It means um, it you know it it sucks the goats. That's li- literally the translation. And they were smaller than these. Wolfmen type creatures or dogmen, whatever you want to call them. Um, sometimes they had scales. They had were occasionally described with wings. They had um, a different looking sort of claw. Um, the wolf, the wolfmen or dogmen leave wolf or canine prints. They they just look like a very large wolf or canine print with the claws and everything. Uh, the chupacabras had different um, different looking claw. So there were many different distinctions. Most importantly was that they were seen by those witnesses who were able to describe them from close range as having what looked like these hollow tubules protruding from their mouth that supposedly were the instruments that they used to actually drain this blood from all of these animals. And that's something that you would not see in any canine. So they were smaller, um, had some oddities. They also had a pretty noticeable row of kind of spiked appendages down the back and uh, right down onto the tail. So they did have sort of a different look. Huh. All right. Um, there are many things we can talk of. Um, I, I, let's talk a little bit about what's called the Beast of Bray Road. This sounds so interesting. I've never heard any of this, Linda. Never. Never. Okay, sure. Well, we'll start. That's right at the beginning, so that's a very good place to go. That's what got me into this whole thing in the first place. I was working in um, 1990, 1991, first as an editorial cartoonist and then as a reporter for a countywide newspaper here in southern Wisconsin. And one of the first stories that came my way, partly because nobody else wanted to touch it, was a tip-off that I got that people around my own little hometown of Elkhorn, Wisconsin, were saying that there was what they were calling a werewolf out on this stretch of country road outside a town called Bray Road. And I know I laughed. I <laughs> and it wasn't that I was skeptical of all things unusual. I had been um, kind of a UFO fan and had read about Bigfoot. My dad was a science fiction fan, and so we always had these things around the house. But I had never thought about such a thing as a werewolf being real or appearing out where people, especially people I knew, could see it. And so I I still was curious, though, as to where the rumor was coming from, and I started asking around and discovered that there were people who were talking about this. A few of them uh, were people that I knew, and I happened to be working with the county animal control officer on another project at that time. He was looking into some local puppy mills and things like that. And so I asked him, his name was John Fredrickson, if he had heard anything about it. And he said, oh, sure. And I'm sitting in his office, Art, and he pulls out from his official desk, official manila file folder, which he has labeled werewolf. Oh, <laughs> really? Now, when you've got a county official with a file folder marked werewolf, that's news. Uh, I mean, it is, thing. actually, yes. Yeah, I mean, no matter what comes of it. You were there, the uh, were you there at that point as a reporter? Yes. And you yes. saw you saw a file marked he werewolf? Pulled it out. Yes, he had it marked werewolf. And inside <laughs> were um, the contact information and notes that he'd been taking from people that were calling him and saying, I saw this thing out on Bray Road or nearby it. 
I don't know what it was, but, you know, it, and it was doing various things. One woman saw it kind of squatting, kneeling by the side of the road, holding some kind of maggoty roadkill, like maybe a dead raccoon, she thought, in its upturned palms, which is not the way that you see canines sitting and eating things. And it right. was huge. Right. Um, you know, another woman saw, thought she saw something coming out of a cornfield, and she slowed down and felt kind of a bump. She didn't know if she'd hit something, so she stopped, got out of her car, and looked and turned around. And she said, I saw this thing. I mean, that's the word people consistently use, pounding toward me. And she said it was running on its hind legs. Um, She said she had a relative who was a very large wrestler, and this thing had at least as many muscles and was bigger. Back back up just a little. Running on its hind legs. Right. Mm -hmm. So that includes, you know, that seems to be bipedal, right? Yes. Um, Mm -hmm. Now, what animal do we know of on Earth uh, other than maybe the kangaroo? I don't know. How many run on their hind legs? Well, not a lot. I mean, there are certain lizards that do. Um, There are lots of mammals that can run on their hind legs if they want to or need to. I mean, if they're motivated, if, if their front limbs are injured perhaps or they're born without them, they can very often transition. There's some wonderful YouTube videos about um, a bear with an injured forelimb that is able to run around on its hind legs. There are dogs trained to dance beautifully on their hind legs. Trained, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or the, the thing is that in the wild, they usually don't last very long because if it's a prey animal like a deer, which can also, I've seen a deer walking on its hind legs to get at a bird feeder, for instance, but if they're restricted to that, they usually can't get away from predators very easily. And if it's a predator, they usually can't hunt very easily. So they're usually not around too long, and they're not going to be bothering humans a lot. But um, these animals that people were reporting seemed large. Usually the uh, the height was estimated um, between 6 and 7 feet and very healthy with abundant fur all over the body. And the only really odd thing besides them running on their hind legs was that people would say, I had a strange feeling that it was leering. They would use three words, leering, jeering, or sneering. Mm -hmm. These were the ones they always picked. Like it was sussing me out the same way I was looking at it. It was curious of me. It, I felt like it was superior to me or, um, you know, it just had this weird attitude that you don't see in normal wild animals. And hmm. it was that freaked them out more than anything else, I think. Um, it certainly would me, no question about that. Uh, inside this folder, did he happen to have any photographs or video or drawings or whatever? No, no, just the notes, you know, that he'd been taking. He'd been speaking mostly by phone to them, but he shared the contact information with me, and I went out and interviewed them, and I did get some of them to draw um, some rough sketches. And I was kind of surprised at several things. One was that these people just didn't seem like hoaxers. It was a a widely diverse group. It included men, women, children, blue-collar, white-collar, farmers, professional people. Um, It was a very wide spectrum. There were more than I expected. And they just didn't seem like they were lying. They sure, didn't uh, common sense uh, says when you have that many people in one area reporting you're onto something. Exactly, exactly. And a few of them knew one another, but most of them didn't. They weren't all exactly on the road. The, the Bray Road is a connector between two highways, and then there are other roads kind of branching out from uh, the ends of it. And so um, there were people all around this sort of nexus. You know, you could kind of draw a little circular area. And I just thought, well, this is something really unusual. And if it's nothing but folklore, well, folklore is something people write down and keep track of, then that's worth it. If it turns out to be nothing than just some strange fluke that all these people had the same hallucination at different Mm. times and places, often years apart, I might add. Folklore mostly doesn't have you calling the cops. You might make note of it, you might write about it, but you don't call the cops. Exactly. Yeah, and the other thing was, if you're a hoaxer, you don't usually call the cops because who, knowing that they're committing fraud, are going to call the local 
officials and um, leave their handy information to be tracked down and charged with fraud. Or no, and I, you know, I've interviewed like Bigfoot investigators, and I've always thought the dumbest thing that anybody could ever do would be to put on a Bigfoot costume and go roaming around to freak yeah. out the local populace. You know, uh, like I've described, little gray aliens yeah. who would land, they'd be so full of lead by the time, you know. <laughs> Yeah, and that's really true. And well, I think it was the year before last. There was some guy in a ghillie suit out in Montana, who I think got hit by two vehicles when he ran out onto the road. Now there have been hoaxes on Bray Road. I know of a few of them, um, where one one was a farmer who wore a bear suit because he wanted to stop parking kids from coming really? out on his land. Dumb. And yep, and I know another guy who was a county official who. But to see, this was after these things had occurred, and I've never been able to um, hook up uh, the time frame with one of these known hoaxers with any of the known sightings. But, yeah, this was a guy who was um, a government official, and he thought that it would be funny to put on a gorilla suit and run across the road, but he only did it once. And, and uh, it's it's very dangerous, and I've often thought... Really, they're not thinking about. Uh, they could cause a car to go off the road for all they know, mm. you know. So, but but there are people who do it. I I know that. And there uh, there are I many don't... many county officials, Linda, that act uh, like gorillas. We'll we'll be back. Linda Godfrey is my guest. She knows about these creatures for real, the real ones, the real beast types of Bray Road. This is Midnight in the Desert. I'm Art Bell. Spans the world. To call us from outside the U.S. and Canada only, use Skype with a headset mic if on a computer and call MITD 55. That's MITD 55. We're talking um, with Lynn Godfrey about creatures. And I, I, you know, I've really got to tell you all that I walk at night a lot. In fact, every night I walk at night. And there are things moving here in the desert, big things, little things, big things, and you can hear them moving uh, because the desert is so quiet at night, you know, generally star lit from end to end and very, very dark and things move in the night. And of course, you, you don't know what they are. <laughs> oh my. Anyway, Linda, back uh, to your side of the world. Uh, or the country, and, and the Beast of Bray Road. So he had this folder full of uh, info about this, well, werewolves. It was called werewolves. Right. Well, I chose the word beast because even right from the beginning, I was uneasy with that term werewolf and all the, the baggage. But I will say that you find it in a lot of my book titles because um, most publishers consider the word werewolf much sexier than my preferred term, which is unknown, upright, canid. <laughs> so, so the word werewolf gets used there, and it does serve to give people a fairly accurate mental picture of at least what they're talking about. It's different sound. It's a different thing than Bigfoot. It's a different thing than um, you know a centaur or a satyr or anything like that. It's it's oh, it's an upright, wolf-like looking. Creature. Well, I can see what you described uh, being upright and very furry could be described as Bigfoot, really, um, and what you described also was tall. and th So there's a lot of similarity there. There is some, right. But anybody who gets a good look at it is usually quite, quite sure that it's one or the other because there are also some really big differences. The Bigfoot, for instance, is usually not only taller but weighs probably two or three times as much. It's much more muscular. Um, it's got the long arms that come down much farther than a human's or a dog's right. would. Right. You don't see the ears. It's usually, you know, you might see the, the crest on the head or the round head covered with fur all over. It does not have that long muzzle. Some of them have a slightly prognathic jaw or, or a slight protrusion, 
but you can see that in some humans too. You know, it's but people describe with the dog man is this long jaw full of canine teeth, fangs. Whereas um, people that I know that have seen a Bigfoot mouth up close, an open Bigfoot mouth up close, have described um, teeth that look more like really big human teeth. You know, they're they're the flat, right? Um, flat type. So that's different. The biggest difference is probably in their legs. The Bigfoot is some sort of primate. We don't know what kind um, for sure, but it walks flat-footed, that much we know. Its footprints are very much like a human's, um, very large, whereas the canine walks, um, I guess the official term is digitigrade on its toe pads. And people will say, this is, I still hear it continually with almost every case report. People will say, you know, it ran or it walked really well on its hind legs, except its legs were facing backwards. Legs were turned backwards. And by that, they're meaning that they observed that this was walking on its toe pads, and then there's a little um, thin leg area leading up to what would be analogous to the human heel and ankle area, which we would call the hock in an animal. Right. And they're expecting, because it's above the ground, they're expecting it to be a knee projecting forward. And what's analogous to our knee joint is really up a little farther by what we would call the thigh. So um, they're looking at it and they're thinking of it in terms of, uh, well, if it was a human, you know, the leg would be bent backwards. But that just tells me that they're accurately describing a canine rather than a primate. All right. Here's something from Curtis. Uh, I get these messages by computer. It's called the wormhole. Um, and Curtis says, I have seen a werewolf-like creature face-to-face in southern Indiana near a farm slash woods. It had red eyes, emanated pure evil, and hate. Has Linda had any reports like this from the Midwest? Um, yeah, most of the time reports like that are near, not always, but but quite often they're near some sort of of, uh, Native American reservation Uh or land like that. When I hear red eyes and exuding pure evil and um, another trait for that usual type is that it will seem to have actual shoulders. Canines do not have shoulders, but they will describe big shoulders, bigger muscles, and hands rather than paws. And that I relate to a type of, uh, of um, it's considered not an apparition, but a projection or some sort of an apparent transformation that certain people who take the bad medicine path are able to, tra- to, uh, to make. And there are different names. It's called the skin changer, skin walker, um, different terms that people might recognize. Did you say people who take bad medicine? who followed the bad path of what Native Americans would call a medicine path. That means a spiritual way okay. that they take. And, um, no, it's, it's not like getting a bad dose of Maalox and you turn into <laughs> to a... You take a bad right. dose of something or another and you'll you'll probably see something. Um, well, yeah, there's, an, there's another whole world there. <laughs> yeah, there is. Um, okay, so... What really bothers me about this, and I don't scare easily, not much scares me. I've dealt with, you know, reports of chupacabras and all kinds of things. But I must say, I have a phobia about red eyes. Uh, I don't know what it is about red eyes, red glowing eyes. Linda, honest to God, it scares the hell out of me. Yeah, because it's it's uh, not what we're accustomed to seeing, you know. And um, the, the eye shine at night is scary enough if it's green or yellow or white, whatever, you know, because you know you're looking at something that can see you while yes. you can't see it. That's, that's, a, that's bad that's enough, that's right. But red, exactly. oh, red is bad, Linda. Bad. Yeah, and you know, I do get, um, I mean, I've been at this now for 23 years, and I started getting reports of all types of things right from the beginning. And one thing I've noticed, and I try to go not by my own thoughts, but by what the reports are telling me. And when I started sorting these out and really looking after I'd amassed quite a few what um, connections were between eye color, I realized that anyone who was sure they were seeing a Bigfoot and it was giving off eye shine was seeing a red color. Mm -hmm. Um, These skinwalker types that seemed to be somewhat more of the supernatural, if you will, 
for lack of a better word, side had invariably had red eye shine. And the other upright canines that just seemed like maybe a, a strange wolf that got up and started walking one day um, would invariably have the yellow, yellow, green, normal canine eye shine color. All right. Uh, you know, obviously, some of these things are out there. The question I have, I guess, is what I ask a lot of Bigfoot foot, uh, researchers, and that is, how do they stay, for the most part, hidden? How do they stay away from mm-hmm. human beings? We are so, uh, or are we? I mean, there are a lot of open areas left, um, and I need to keep mm-hmm. that in mind. But, but you know, civilization has spread, concrete has spread. It must be harder for them. Yeah, I I agree, and that always is one of the the very most germane questions. Um, It's one thing that has led me to kind of reconsider my position on both of these being totally natural animals because as we do start moving more and more into the interiors of all these giant national forests and state parks that people never really... uh, got into so much before but but it's becoming much more of a popular pastime um and people are out there looking people are much more aware of all these types of things some are carrying guns some are using drones you'd think that we're, and trail cams have been invented you know we've got trail cams everywhere that's right and cougars or mountain lions are one of the most elusive of all known natural animals and even they will sometimes show up on a trail cam, or we can spot them. Um, the one that ended up down near downtown Chicago five years ago was able to be shot and cap, you know. And we capture bears, um, and these things don't seem to have a big problem with being seen on trail cams. When it comes to the dogmen and the foot, I know this from experience because I do a lot of field work and uh, have a tra- trail cam. Work with people with trail cams. No matter how hard you try. You can have the trail cam working perfectly. It will take wonderful shots. You can see a raccoon coming, sniffing around. Most of the time you'll see something like a dog or or, um, a coyote or some other mundane animal taking whatever the bait is. But on times when you can tell because there are prints or it's something that's impossible for something else to get, when when a bait is taken, um, either the trail camera will be somehow wrenched to the side or it'll be something standing in front of it. It'll come out completely black, completely white, or there will be a misty thing covering what you see of the the uh, the site that is being photographed. Okay, so that and indicates when, intelligence, if not perhaps super mm-hmm. intelligence. Right. When it's all done, the bait's gone, and you don't know who took it or what took it or how it happened. And, yeah, yeah. it implies a, a, not only an intelligence, but an awareness that this is something that it shouldn't be seen on. And maybe some kind of supernatural ability as well. Yeah, you know, it's it's something beyond what normal animals would have. Okay, other than a guy named Bugs, who I'm still worried for, uh, who claims he shot and buried a couple of Bigfoot in uh, Texas, mm-hmm. um, I don't know of any... I don't know of any reports of any of these animals being shot and then being put on display. So, I, again, this is something I ask Bigfoot investigators, but it seems almost as though these things cannot be shot, uh, mm-hmm. and and that leads one back toward the paranormal uh, explanation. What what do you think? Right. It's inexplicable. Um, I have a number of reports of people who ended up emptying automatic rounds into both Bigfoot and the Dogman. Really? And it just looks at them. It usually leaves at that point, but um, they don't, and and those who are brave enough to try and follow it, find broken brush, you know, evidence that something has walked that way, and then all of a sudden they just lose the trail and it's gone. It's like it got out of sight, and then um, my Native American friends would say it went back to the spirit world. And Honestly, I've heard that um, for many years, and I have to say that this paradigm that so many Native American friends have told me from different tribes that these creatures are, um, they have dual, dual existences. 
when they're here, they're physical, they're corporeal, they need to eat, they can breathe, they um, you know need energy, but they can go to what they would call the spirit world, what we might call a world in another dimension, um, a bubble world attached to this world. Um, and you're saying so that Native Americans understand these creatures um, perhaps in the same way we do, using different language to discuss, uh, for example, the spirit world. We might talk about different dimensions. Right. So it's it's right. sort of all explaining the same thing. That's how it seems to me. You know, it to me it seems a difference in terminology. And what they've said to me is that they, these creatures, that, and they're usually speaking to me about the dog man and the wolf man, have been here longer than people, and they know how to get between the worlds. They have their own reasons for being here. And you'll find variations. Um, you know, some believe they're evil, some believe they're benign. Some believe that if you see one, it means someone's going to die. So there are different interpretations that way. But when it comes to the actual nature, um, in most cases, um, and I've talked to some pretty interesting people. I know one person who told me this was a woman who is not only has a doctorate in anthropology, but is also an elder in the Ho-Trunk, Ho-Chunk tribe here in Wisconsin, which is notoriously closed-mouthed about revealing these sorts of things. Um, but it, it's it's just so parallel to this idea of different dimensions that I think it's almost impossible not to make that comparison. And so that is, uh, if you had to make a guess, that's your best guess? Well, it suits the large majority of the facts given in um, these reports the best. It, it, it's the paradigm that fits everything the best because after a while, you get so many reports from credible witnesses saying things like, um, you know, it was running from me, and all of a sudden it just disappeared. Mm -hmm. um, I saw footprints. I heard it going through, but I couldn't see the animal. Okay, um, so the, foot, saw, like, the he, footprints after, remain to be measured, Linda? I'm sorry to interrupt. They remain to be uh, measured? Yes, yes, in many cases. Um, yeah, <laughs> It's, and that happens both with a dog man and with the Bigfoot. Um, I've seen Bigfoot prints. Um, you know, I've, I've cast some. I've, I've never had a good enough, deep enough one that it was a great cast, but, you know, I've seen them and, and uh, measured them and that sort of thing. I've got lots of uh, photos of uh, dog man prints that just look like lar very large, uh, larger than wolf prints, even uh, canine prints in many cases. Um I've got one place where I've been working with a property owner for two years, and we have several different kinds of footprints. And in one instance, um, the footprint started in the middle of a snowy field, six inches of snow with a delicate crust on the top, and all of a sudden something appears, rolls around in this area a little bit, and then gets up and walks off in a biped fashion towards some woods. And these Footprints begin in the middle of a pristine they begin, field. They begin in the middle of the field, huh. and then and then they walk out. The alternative is there that is that it walked backwards bipedally from the forest, and then turned around, and then somehow, but then it doesn't show you where it goes from there. That's it's a know, mystery so. either way. Mm -hmm, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and we have, um, uh, and that is a crazy place, I'll tell you. that. So one. in other words, it appeared kind of out, out of nowhere like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, the only way, the only ways I could think of is if a helicopter lowered an animal down, you know, off a little rope ladder. Oh, they're going to do that, I'm sure. Or, or a flying saucer or UFO beamed it down. You know, it's just, where did it come from? There's, there's just, and I've... I've got photographs of it. Um, they're slightly imperfect. They were taken by the, the homeowner when he wasn't exactly sure, you know, yet what he was doing there. But um, they do show them. And well, of course, uh, after you, I suppose, have published a number of books about this kind of thing, people come to you, I'm sure, in droves with these stories. Well, yeah. Um, it started, this was the weird thing, going back to when that Be that Beast of Bray Road story broke, um, I remember talking about it to my editor, and we agreed that people would locally have fun with it for maybe a couple of weeks and forget about it. And immediately it went 
national. And this was before things went viral on the Internet. Almost nobody was on the Internet. People had to write me snail mail or find a, uh, an actual phone and, and number and, and call me at, at there. And what happened was, um, the media began coming right away. I was on radio shows everywhere. The local Milwaukee and Madison TV channels came, and then it went out to um, Net- Inside Edition came when Bill O'Reilly was still on Inside Edition. Right. Um, different different shows, and that caused a great flood of letters from people. Of course. Who said I saw the same thing? I never knew who to tell before, and this continued. I worked for that newspaper for 10 years, and even though I wasn't doing really things to promote it, it just kept up. And finally, it was um, a good, what was uh, 2003 when I decided to finally write the book so that there would be a permanent record and people would have a place to go. And the book then brought a huge spate of new ones, and that's just continued um, for the 11 years I've been writing books. Linda, are you aware of any um, human beings being either harmed, maimed, killed by any of these creatures? Not in cases that are reported to me directly. I've heard of other cases where people have claimed this, but they weren't things that I investigated. Um, I didn't have any way to vouch for their validity. Um, But in 23 years, the only personal injury that I've had is from a man in Quebec who wrote me that he encountered an upright wolf-like creature on a trail. Um, He wasn't armed or anything. He kind of panicked. He said he felt that it was going to jump at him, and he kind of jumped the other way. It accidentally, he feels, tore his hip and his flank with one of its fangs, and he had to go to the hospital and get stitches. He sent me a picture of the scar, which doesn't necessarily prove it, but it sure looked like That's something that was made pretty by good proof DVD. actually all right yeah. uh linda hold tight we'll be right back To initiate a dialogue sequence with Art Bell, please coordinate your phalanges and call 1-952-225-5278. That's 1-952-CALL-ART. We will get to the telephone, so hang in there. Linda Godfrey is my guest. We're talking about werewolves. Werewolves and uh, things like werewolves. Creatures that move in the night, and they do indeed move in the night. I hear from so many people. Linda, um, here's one. Jason writes, I'm partially, I believe it's Lumbee Indian, and I'm very interested in where you think the show Hemlock Grove's Rules for Werewolves, how can, uh, for how werewolves can change without a moon, but uh, it causes a curse to incur and drive the wolf either insane or demonic, based upon the traditional werewolf lore, I guess. Um, is he, I'm sorry, did he say about a show? I'm, I didn't quite understand. Um, okay, I'm personally love the Indian. I'm very interested in where you think the show Hemlock Grove's rules. Uh, is there a show called Hemlock Grove? I don't know. I haven't seen it. I'm sorry. Okay. I haven't either. I Sorry, really Jason. Of TV. <laughs> Sorry, I wish I could answer better to that. Okay. Um, well, you must have seen Twilight, right? You laughed. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, the thing is, um, I have actually tried to correlate full moons to the sightings of these things. And found nothing? And found really nothing. Um, the closest I've found... Is and my most recent study, um, everything that's in my my new book that will be coming out in 2016 that's at the publisher right now. Um, I went through the whole thing, and everyone that had a date that I could go back and look up, look it up on a full moon chart, I did. And the closest coronation, co- correlation was not a full moon, but a half to three quarters moon. Here's something I can tell you. I, I don't know how a full, a full moon would affect um, a, a werewolf or any other weird creature we're talking about tonight, but 
it sure as hell affects humans. When I was in the uh, Air Force, I worked uh, as a medic and uh, somewhat in a hospital. And let me tell you, Linda, full moons brought it on. And police officers can tell you, look out for people during full moons. I mean, it's just, mm-hmm. it's just, even talk shows can tell you. Uh, sure. The calls get pretty weird with full moons. So they affect human beings, and if they affect us, then they probably affect things with fangs and red eyes. Well, they they could, definitely, you know, and there there may be something to that, although, as I said, I haven't found it. But there's also a flip side, and the thing about being a reporter for 10 years is I still have this little devil's advocate sitting with its claws firmly entrenched into my shoulder, making me give the other side. And the thing is that when there's a full moon, there are more people out at night, and people can see better than they normally can. They can True. can see animals and creatures and things that might be lurking around that normally would just be part of the darkness to them. So um, is it that animals are doing more or just that we're out there and able to see more? You know, that that's another possibility. It's a possibility. Um, but I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. I think the full moon has an effect on behavior. Mm-hmm. Of mammals, I, I believe yeah, that. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that too. You know, I think that it does. And you know, there's another thing that I did find had a stronger correlation than full moons because this was the other thing that I began to look up whenever I could um, find a, a close enough something with a close enough date. Sometimes things happen like ten years earlier, and people have no idea, right. you know, what what um, the conditions were. But solar flares. Um, seem to have a higher positivity rate than full moons. And to me, that makes a lot of sense because when there's a sunstorm, what does that affect? Electromagnetic systems. What is the human body? What are animal bodies? We are electro, we generate we our own electromagnetic fields. That's what we are. The electromagnetic field holds all these atoms together that make up our body we well look at our up. look at our brains linda have you ever watched an operation where they're doing they're doing brain surgery on a guy yeah. uh by the way who is awake while they're doing it mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. you don't really have feelings in your brain they mm-hmm. give you a, a little anesthetic when they cut and then when they put you back to sleep at the end when they're going to stitch you up but in between you're awake and they touch a tiny electrode to a part of your brain and pretty soon your hand won't move or your speech is different uh, right. it, that's all it takes is a little tiny, tiny bit of electric current. So you're right. When we're hitting, getting hit with solar storms, we are being bombarded. And mm-hmm. sure, it may have a, an effect, yes. Well, you know, there have been some pioneering researchers. Um, Persinger and Lafreniere have this book, Transient... Um, Oh, I'm blanking on the name of it, but people will understand what it is. And Janet and Colin Board have both done studies where they've looked up spots of major known strange creature or anomalous creature sightings and then tried to um, see where there might be some deviation in the electromagnetic field of the area. And they found a correlation between natural geological features such as uh, quartz formations, granite formations, that kind of thing, and hot spots of these creature flaps. What so, uh, yeah. What's out there that's likely to... I mean, we get these reports of ripped-out throats, and again, I I'm, guess I'm headed toward the chupacabra, but these things are so real, Linda. You know, they, they empty the blood of the victim. Mm-hmm. Whether it's a goat or whatever it is, they come out bloodless. What do we know about creatures that drink that drain the blood of their victim um and otherwise leave them alone that yeah that's that's a good question and these it's true that these things are found um the place where i ha- and that happens a lot in um the cattle mutilations that have been occurring around the country i know there are it does. Um, bigger experts on that than than me Linda Mohau you know for one and they find these animals um, bloodless. There's no blood splattered around the area. Things are surgically removed. Oh, yeah. Um, and I've got pictures of the same thing um, right here in Wisconsin, different areas, 
I've got one from a farmer in central Wisconsin that shows an entire front leg quarter perfectly removed. It looks like somebody took a scalpel and cut around it, and certain other things are cut out. And there's no blood splashed around anywhere. It hasn't been dragged. And I've got one, a very similar picture, of a deer that had the exact same removal made. And this was, I know for a fact, um, not a fresh deer, nothing that a human would want to eat or be able to eat. Um, and yet something did this. You know, it was it was bloodless. Um, something in that same spot picked up a 60-pound deer, carried it over a barbed or through one or the other, a barbed wire fence, left leaving by beetle canine-like prints, and walked all the way through a field. Um, two men were able to track it until it crossed the road. Um, what can do that? They knew it had to have been carrying it over its shoulder because there were no drag marks. Have you begun and, to experiment yourself, Linda? Well, um, I experiment myself in smaller ways, but I've been working on a larger study with a property owner who has um, some acreage, kind of a hobby farm, who began finding strangely mutilated things on his property and uh, eventually called me, and, and we've been kind of working together on it. But uh-huh. I do investigations. I mean, I'll go out and, you know, find footprints. I've had encounters myself. Um, you like, know, so what? I, I've, like what? Like <laughs> what? Well, the only dog man encounter that I've had, and I believe that it was, although I can't totally prove it, it starts out my book, um, The Michigan Dog Man, titled The Michigan Dog Man. I was on site with a History Channel cameraman in a very remote gravel road in Michigan, kind of near the huge Manistee National Forest with a couple of witnesses, and it was about 2 a.m., 2.30 a.m. It was like 90 degrees and almost 100% humidity. We were just, you know, drenched in sweat, and we kept hearing sounds like some large dog shaking its fur out like 30 feet away in the bushes. We kept seeing yellow eyes shine. We kept hearing things um, trotting around us. And finally, we had a spotlight set up on the road. And finally, I happened to look one way and saw something start to run across the road. And its fur was just the edge of its spine. The the fur was caught in that spotlight. It was gray fur. I could see very clearly. I wasn't that far away from it. And it was vertical. And we know that it was at least seven feet tall because it momentarily blotted out a reflective Roadside, and when it crossed to the other side of the road, and one of the other witnesses saw it too. Of course, the cameraman had his camera aimed the opposite direction during the few moments it took for that thing to cross. And at that point, the witnesses just started trembling because they'd had one of them. They'd seen a tall gray one and a shorter dark brown one, and one had chased their car, and they insisted we leave at that point. My God, you have one actual real, no question sighting, the History Channel there with a cameraman. He's pointing the other way. Mm -hmm. And I had taken pictures. I had some really interesting pictures, and my camera disappeared, and there was no person there. Yes. In fact, it was so inexplicable. Um, We searched the ditches. We searched all kinds of places. There was nobody there. You're telling me that that you had a camera, even though the History Channel guy was pointed the wrong way, you had a camera, you you had the presence of mind to take pictures? Well, not of that. I, I, I mean, that was too momentary. But before, there had been other things I had taken pictures of, like footprints and um, the eyes, you know, and that kind of thing. Then your camera was gone. And, and it, yeah, I finally ran out of uh, battery and film, and I placed it inside the the van, the History Channel van, where nobody would have been able to get it. If either of the two witnesses had had gone for it, I would have seen it. I was standing, leaning next to the van, and at the end of all that, it was gone. There was absolutely no explanation, and the History Channel actually bought me a new camera to replace it because neither the cameraman nor the witnesses nor I could explain where it went. Here's Greg from... uh Caledonia. He says, Art, I'm originally from southeast Wisconsin. I've ridden my motorcycle down Bray Road at night, and I must say the area around is kind of marshy, and at night it's often foggy. I've heard of the beast, and 
I was really on edge the whole way. So a lot of people have heard about this Bray Road thing, mm-hmm. Bray Road thing, a lot of them. Right. Um, yeah, it's quite well known. There's a movie I had nothing to do with that's sort of a, um old-fashioned style horror or gory flick that has, bears no relationship to anything real that happened. But it, that helped to make it a lot more famous. Actually. All right, I'm going to ask you something now that is uh, a total turn in the corner, but I think it's in an area that you cover as well. Mm-hmm. You remember 9/11, of course, right? Mm-hmm. Oh yes, yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, everybody does. Yep. Sadly. And I can't remember the specific p- picture, but I am telling you, Linda. Somewhere uh, in the array of 9-11 pictures, photographs that were taken and video, there was a picture, and and there was scale for the picture, so you could tell some kind of gigantic bird or winged creature of some sort uh, was in one of these photographs. And if, Hmm. if you didn't see it, if nobody called your attention to it, I can't because I don't have it right now, but I know it's out there somewhere. Somebody Hmm. will send it to me or something. And it brings up the whole subject at at any rate of these gigantic winged whatevers. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I, I remember seeing that at some point, but it's been a very long time. You know, so I'd, I'd be reluctant to talk about that one thing, but you do get this recurring theme of winged things being thought of as harbingers of doom of some type or another. You know, and of course the classic would be Mothman in, in Point Pleasant, Virginia, which began to be seen around this community, and then the Silver Bridge goes down and all these people are drowned and killed um, before it. Um, I've had a sighting of what some people call the bat squat, these bat winged 20 wings 20 foot wingspan bat winged things with furry humanoids in the center um that it it occurred three days before a drowning an unexplained drowning of university student in la crosse wisconsin um i don't think all of them are but it does seem that there are, are quite a few um that that have this harbinger of doom or prophecy. Something that big with talons grabs you, it's not a harbinger. It is doom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you, you would not want to be grabbed. No. But seriously, there have been photographs of incredibly yeah. large winged flying things. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, it opens up the possibility, again, that Bigfoot, werewolves, all these creatures that we can't account for, chupacabras, uh, things that fly may come from elsewhere and blink in and out of existence from our perspective. I, You know, I cannot refute that anymore because I've just had too many eyewitness reports over the years. Um, and then I see everybody, you know, other people's work too. It's just not my own work, but it's something that occurs over and over again. And um, people like John Keel, um, a lot of my present-day colleagues are all sort of coming to the, not all, but many are sort of coming to this realization that there just isn't any way to explain them via only the natural realm anymore. You know, it's just, how can you have birds flying around with 20-foot wingspans? And actually, I've got one of the best examples of one of these giant bird sightings I've ever seen anywhere, if I do say so myself, starting out my Mary Monsters book. This happened in Hayward, Wisconsin where a man, a middle-aged, prosperous businessman, is riding around this kind of upscale resort community near Haywood, not too far from the Mississippi River and and, and, uh, Minnesota, I might add. And it's a beautiful day. He's on a bicycle. He didn't even bring his camera because he was just going out for a bike ride before breakfast. And he looks to the right, and there's this meadow with this high grass, and he sees this bird. Now, this man... um, John Bolduan, didn't mind giving his name, is over, he's about six foot two, and he realized that this bird standing there, which was of a type he couldn't recognize, was at least a foot taller than him, maybe more, that it was standing seven to eight feet tall or more in this meadow. And he was so thrilled and fascinated with it, he put down his bike and he started just walking into the meadow. And then he stopped cold thinking, 
uh oh, what if this is a female sitting on a nest? And he was, it was kind of a stork like bird with this long beak. That's right. And he's starting to think about what it could do to him with that beak. That's and right. suddenly it turns and sees him. So it, and that was kind of the, um, the do or die moment. But luckily for him, the bird decided to fly away. And so he sees its wings come out, and they were so big, it had to flap them in a billowing manner to get enough air underneath them to take off at all. And then it moved over toward the road that he's riding on. And when I went up there and interviewed him and measured the road, that asphalt road measured between 20 and 22 feet wide. And he said that its wingtips spread from side to side, minimum. And he watched it flying up the road toward where he knew there was a small airport um, that serviced mostly the private planes that came in. And he thought, oh, good, somebody's there is going to have caught it on radar um, or they'll have seen it or something, get some corroboration. And when he inquired, it was completely denied. Nope, saw nothing weird on radar. Nope, we didn't see it. We didn't see it. Huh. And yet, I mean, this was over, you know, several minutes. It was broad daylight, close range. And, you know, a man in perfect health with good eyesight in the daytime. So um, it, the trouble with most large bird sightings is they're up in the air and you have nothing to compare them to to really get a good idea of their size. And, and that argument is completely taken away in this case. All right. Well, here's a hard one for you, and it, it's the one that goes to all the Bigfoot guys, and that is if something um, this out of our normal frame of reference is seen by somebody, whether it's in the woods or wherever it is, um, there are some people who say, look, take a gun, shoot the thing, we'll get it, we'll dissect it, we'll do all the things that a lot of people hate to think about, and we'll find out what it is and and everything we can about it. And, and for that reason, it should be shot. Other people say no. Um, Never, never, never would, you know, that a lot of people don't want anything to be shot. And, uh, mm -hmm. which, which camp are you in? Yeah, this is a really controversial thing going on right now. And I have to say, first of all, I am not, um, a vegetarian. I eat meat. I <laughs> come from a long line of hunters. My dad was an avid deer hunter. My husband's an avid deer hunter. Now, I'm not asking you to eat it. <laughs> but I'm just saying I'm not one. Of, I'm not one of these no gun, no kill anything people. But right. I do believe that it is wrong and crazy to go out and kill something that when you don't know what it is, just to find out what it is. Because how are you going to know if you're going to like what you find? There are crazy people who wear ghillie suits and bear suits and things like that that are out in the woods. You might be shooting a human without knowing it, and then you're up for murder. Well, maybe, may maybe, maybe, maybe. maybe. That, that, well, hold on, Linda. I've got a break. I get so interested in what I'm doing that I, I sometimes blow my brakes, but I need this one. So <laughs> we'll be right back. We're talking about werewolves and much, much more. The Dark Matter Digital Network. This is Midnight in the Desert with your host, Art Bell. Now, here's Art. Here I am, and uh, Lynn, Lynn Godfrey is here. We're talking about, frankly, all manner of creatures that are just not normal. And if anybody out there has that 9-11 picture or knows the one I'm talking about, boy, I sure would love to get a copy of that. It uh, it it showed one of the buildings. I can't remember who took it, where it was, but I went, oh, my God. Actually, you know, I think I said something on the air about it. I believe I did. And I haven't seen that picture in a long time, but you could tell by the scale of the distance in the building that whatever it was was absolutely gigantic. Well, okay, Linda, we're back on one quick question from Mark in Huntsville, Alabama, and it's a good one, too. Please ask her if anybody has reported any sort of smell 
emanating from these uh, biped dog-like animals, and and it, it really goes for all these animals. Uh, they generally have odors associated with them, right? Yeah, yeah, that's something that it's it's one of my standard questions when I interview someone, and uh, oftentimes they'll just volunteer that. I won't even have to ask it, but um, they vary slightly. For the dog man, they'll say it smells like the one one. Uh, Example is they, they'll say it smells like the worst wet, filthy dog smell. That like if your dog needed I know a that smell yes in its life and very sharp and ammonia like and sometimes with a sulfur tinge to it. And then with the Bigfoot, um, I'll get they seem to have a range of smells ranging from mildly offensive where it's just like uh, like kind of a smoky grass type of smell with a little bit of musk to it to something that's a little harsher, more sulfur-like, and um, even more skunk-like. And I have smelled that smell myself and um, describe. It, it's almost like it was exuded in the place where I was. I, I had just had a 35-foot-long, 8-inch diameter living oak branch ripped from a tree right in front of me. And the smell yes. was that 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 slightly skunky but musty grass smell very overwhelming Oof. um how many actual encounters have you had you described the one uh i would think if you're out in the field a lot which i guess you aren't really you're more of an author than you are a investigator right well i i have been whenever there's an incident that i can get there and look for prints, um, examine for hairs, that kind of thing. I like to interview the people in the field. Sure. I do my own research. I have trail cams out. I, you know, assist people um, and do different things. So I, I'm not just an armchair person. I'm not just a writer. Um, I feel I, I like to do my own work and, and be able to report firsthand. And that's why, yeah, I actually have had a number of things happen um, more with the Bigfoot than actually with the Wolfman, maybe. Because really? I, I, well, Bigfoot sightings are a lot more common than the than the Wolfman's or Dogman sightings. There are many, many more of them. I'm not sure why that is. If the population is higher, or the Dogmen are more reclusive, or they're just not quite so huge that you know they're as easy to see. But um, yeah, I've had other experiences with them from listeners. Sure, sure. And I don't call myself an expert, but I, I no, do I, I call a lot you of that. information. That many okay, books, thanks. that many investigations, trust me, you're an expert. Thank you. I, I'm Art Bell. Calls when we come back. screen calls we trust you but remember the nsa well you know to call the show please dial 1-952-225-5278 that's 1-952-CALL-ART <laughs> that may be my favorite hi everybody welcome back linda godfrey's here she's talking about things that walk on two legs and you probably don't want to meet call them werewolves call them what you will uh, and I, let me give my quick uh, speech. I'm sorry, I have to do it every night. It's a mission of mine. You can call us on our public number at uh, area code 952-225-5278. Uh, it's 952-225-5278. Or you can call us by Skype worldwide. And here's the, w the way it works. If you've got a smartphone, listen very, very carefully. You simply install Skype. It's free. Go to your toy store. Android or Apple, doesn't matter. Go to your toy store. Uh, get Skype. You'll love it anyway. When you get Skype, you go in there not to where you dial a number. I get a lot of people making that mistake. You go to where you add a contact. That's an actual thing. Add a contact. It'll say that. 
and there's a little plus sign. And when you press the plus sign, you add a contact. That would be us. And the only thing you've got to type in there is M I if you're in North America, M I T D five one. That's M I T D five one. In the rest of the wide world, you dial you you don't dial. You put in or add contact M I T D five five. That's M I T D five five. And I know that this is getting old for a lot of you, but it results in way better connections. Uh, with those who call in, and it gives you command. If you sound better on the air, you command much more attention. So there's my little lecture out of the way. And by the way, after you do all that, it we will then appear on your contact list. So when you want to call us, you just go bloop, hit it, and it will dial us. And no matter where in the world you are, you call for free. That's the new digital world. Linda, welcome back. Glad to be back. I would like to add, Linda, that I found one of my listeners, they always do, bless their hearts, found for me that picture, the 9-11 picture that I was talking about. I have now sent that to my webmaster, and with any luck at all, he will get that photograph up pronto, and uh, we'll, we'll all be able to look, including you, at what I, you know, all right, he's already done it. How's that for speed? Um, so, uh can you do you have a computer there, Linda? Yeah, are we on artbell.com? Yep. Artbell.com would be the place. Be the first thing, it'll come up and then you have to click on it, make it a little bit bigger. Mm-hmm. Damnedest thing you ever saw. Well, it's um oh there, I see it. Oh yeah, there you go. Now take yep. a take a good look at the blow up of the size of that thing. Linda, compared to, yeah. you know, it's on the other side of the building, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. That is big. That's really, really big. It is. You know, there were a lot of people taking pictures, of course, during all of that. And mm-hmm. what do you think? I mean, how big is that thing? Yeah, it's, you know, like I was saying, when it's when it's in the sky and all that's really next to it is clouds, it's hard to say with any certainty, but I mean it looks gigantic at first glance. Yeah, like it's one of those 20, 25 foot or more wingspan birds, and it's hard to tell just from that what the species is, too. You know, it's. It's um, maybe somebody who's... A, it, well, it's obviously... Look, Linda, it's not in the foreground. Take a good look at the picture uh, at right. the bottom there where you see it uh, with reference to the building. Mm-hmm. So it's obviously yeah, right. far, far away. Then when they blow it up, and they did a pretty good job of blowing it up, that, that's a damn monster. Yeah, it is. And why weren't people seeing it and point? You know, yeah, it's just very... Very strange. Yeah, in that case, you're right. If you're thinking it's on the other side of the other building, then it's got to be double, the, you know, maybe 40 feet, 50 feet. I and those know. look like big wings. I mean, even if it was a close-in picture, you can tell a small bird and a monster. Right. This is, a, right. to me, it's a monster. Anyway, yeah. that, that came to mind. Like Very cool. Wow. <sighs> yeah, I, cool, I guess, uh, unless you happen to meet it. Uh, let's go to some questions. Uh, let's go to some questions. Ty, on uh, Skype, you're on the air with uh, with Linda. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? I do. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. I just wanted to ask Linda if she had any comment about uh, the, the Nigi Naldushi, the Navajo legend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, um, also known as Skinwalkers. I just wondered if you had studied that at all. Yeah, quite a bit. Um, yeah, the, the Yenel Blue She is the, the Navajo name is, I think it actually means something like it goes fast or it goes on for feet. And it's considered, I, I mean, I know Native American people who will not even say that term out loud for fear of drawing its attention to them. But um, it's supposed to be something that is considered sorcery by by the other people and um it does really bad things when it goes out normally that's what it's it's supposedly sent out on bad errands by those who create it and um every tribe seems to have its own version for instance the canadian cree have what they call the bear walker 
and in this instance, there will be a bear that goes forth. And there was even a, there was a bear walker curse put on um, one of the Michigan colleges not too long ago when there was some argument over some uh, remains that needed to be repatriated to that particular tribe. And I've got this in um, my strange Michigan book that I, that I wrote. Um, just, you know, you'd think that these things are from another century or that nobody's practicing them anymore, but from what I understand, um, you know, they they are out there. And people who feel that they've been visited by this will describe something that looks different than the usual dog man um, canine type of thing. It's what we were talking about earlier with the red glowing eyes, the supersized height. It often does things like stare in windows at people, um, track them around at night. Usually it's uh, a very dark in color, um, has shoulders. It will show hands and, and sometimes seems to go to sort of uh, take pains to show that it has hands, laying them right on the windowsill or where the person can see them. So it does have some humanistic fe- uh, features compared to the, the normal canines that we see. Very interesting. And we're well, I don't really know. glad to have you back, Art. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, take care. Uh, that's on Skype. Let's go to the phone, and uh, I think Seattle, Washington, hello there. Hi there, Art. Uh, listen, I've been, I don't know too much about werewolves, but what I've been uh, listening is very interesting. And it, it, uh, it brings to mind a theory of mine. I'd like to ask Linda what she thinks of it. Is it possible that uh, what some people might be thinking they're seeing as werewolves are maybe just uh, drunk Italians? Drunk Italians? Yeah. Oh, um, <laughs> well, you know, I don't think that there is any one nationality or even a human connection to most of these creatures. And, you know, I assume that you're being facetious. Well, he's being a creature. Not a very nice one either. Yeah, yeah. Um, I happen to like Italians. I, I have a lot of, lot of Italian well, friends. Well, I've, I've so just I... heard two, walks on two legs and uh, is, is really hairy, that kind of stuff. So, You know, that's well, just... Usually, that's what you should get is, no, that was my brother-in-law or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> At least it wasn't your sister-in-law. Um, there you go. Okay, uh, let's go... Let's go to Washington, Georgia. Hello. Hello, Linda. Hello, Art. Hi. Hi. Uh, I saw a creature um, when I was uh, camping in Pennsylvania. I don't know if you're familiar with that area at all. Somewhat. uh, I get a lot of I get a lot of reports from there. Okay, great. Um, Well, I was with a couple friends of mine, and they saw it as well. Uh, And it it had yellow eyes. Mm. It Mm. had uh, almost like a human face. Uh, with very long, very big, almost uh, kind of wrinkly ears that had hair on the fur on that as well, and on their faces, like all all the way on its face. It had mm-hmm. very large hands, mm-hmm. uh, but very skinny arms. Mm-hmm. And um, it also had, uh, I noticed that its legs, were you know like the the knees bent backwards like hyperextending you know mm-hmm. in a way and um, classic description the, the the most disturbing thing about it uh, that I didn't hear you uh, comment that still haunts me to this day when I think about is its head movement it it uh it kind of moved its head almost like a like a pigeon and very um, very kind of darty uh, very quick head movements. And, um, you know, it's funny you should say that because I just recently had somebody write me the same thing. They said it was, as they looked at it, it was moving its head sort of back and forth as if it was um, kind of trying to measure when was the best time to pounce. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I saw this, um, it was maybe about two feet away from me. Um, aye, aye, aye. And I don't... I don't Yikes. think it knew I was there because I was uh, sleeping in a Volkswagen van, and it was in a, uh, a campground called Otter Lake in uh, Pennsylvania, and there was uh, a couple of hunters that were up fairly late uh, by the fire, and it seemed to be very engaged in what they were doing, and it was mm. paying a lot of attention to them, peering its head around at the uh, 
the campers very, you know, suddenly. And at first I thought it was another camper. And, you know, when my eyes adjusted and I saw it was, you know, I was absolutely terrified. And uh, for the rest of the night, I, you know, me and my buddy just, you know, cowered in the, the van. And we even called the state police. And, you know, they acted like they didn't know where we were and thought we were drunk. Wow. How did they uh, treat you? Uh, basically, they uh, kind of laughed and said, well, we have no idea where that is. Um, we wouldn't know how to get mm -hmm. to you. We suggest yeah. you stay in the car. And that was basically it. <laughs> Not very that helpful. That's the usual reaction. I actually have had two sheriff's deputies from a, a nearby county here approach me not too long ago to tell me that between the two of them, they had seen four different upright dogman-like creatures over the past couple of years. And their official thing they were supposed to say when they went out to um, check on a place was, I went there and I didn't see anything. Mm -hmm. But yet they will come privately and now you're going to think this is going to seem like a setup because I happen to have in my lap um, one that I got just this last month from a deputy sheriff in Frederick County Virginia who actually saw what I was just telling you uh, about and when he described it he said he originally thought it was a bear with mange and then he noticed it had a curled up long hand paw with curled up looking claws <laughs> Um, that brushed it. He saw it brush a tree, and he felt every hair go up telling me to leave it and it would be okay, so he left. Um, but he said the thing was that um, its head looked like it was twitching constantly, mm -hmm. which yeah, is exactly yeah. like, like what you said. And he said the claws, I will never forget, they were upturned monster claws on long hand paws. Remember I had said elongated paws is one of the, the things that they have. And... Um, this is from a deputy sheriff. Wow. Okay. And uh, another thing, uh, I, I heard it, I, heard, I don't know if it was related, but I heard a very weird call. It was almost uh, oh. like a two-toned, like a, like a scream and, and another call all within one. And I don't know if that had been reported as well or if you've heard anything um. about that. Yeah, I have, although you hear the same sort of description in regard to what are thought of as Bigfoot calls, too. You know, I've heard that applied to the Bigfoot, so it's it's hard to say when you don't see the, anu the animal actually emit it. But um, if you go to lindgodfrey.com, you can find where to email me, and if you want to um, just you know, send me an email um, report of this, I'd really appreciate it because it really... Um, Might make it in a book. <laughs> Absolutely. I can probably get you uh, the other two eyewitnesses. They were brothers. They were there as well. I can uh, probably get them to contribute as well. Oh, that really that counts. When you, you bet. When you get three, then you've really got something. Do that. Mm -hmm. Get it to her. Great. All right. All right thanks thank a million, so caller. All right. Take care. Thank you. Uh, there you go. Uh, Sassy Abby, you're on with Linda. Hi. Hi. I just Hello. met you the other night. Is it echoing? A um, little bit, but not bad. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I just met you the other night when I was scared of the ghost that I don't believe in. Oh, that's right. Yeah, so we listen to you every night. Um, and tonight I was thinking, okay, this, this won't scare me because werewolves, you know. But I had a really weird experience about three months ago. And I was driving home. Um, I had gone to, um, I had to move my mom to Minne um, from Minneapolis to Madison. And I was driving home on one of my trips, moving her stuff alone it was about 1 a.m. and I was in the middle of nowhere so there was, I wasn't in a town or anything and I was really tired because I'd been driving all day and all of a sudden out of the corner of my eye I distinctly saw a person running out of the woods straight towards the side of my car and I was going about 65 mm -hmm. and I thought oh, okay I've been driving too long I'm seeing things and all of a sudden smack into the side of my car and I was terrified because it was pitch black out there's no traffic there's nobody around and there's nothing near me I was just in the middle of nowhere this came out of the woods so you're I telling just, me you hit this thing or it, it hit you me. it ran into, into the, the car, side of my car. What, and any it, damage it, yeah yes <laughs> my car was dented it and it looked like a so person hard. you said what it, it looked like a person, you said? 
Yeah, like out of the corner of my eye, I was really tired, so I don't, you know, I don't know what I saw, but I could have sworn it was on, it was on two legs, and it was probably about six feet taller, taller, and in the corner of my eye, I saw it, and what I saw, thought I saw was a man wearing a gray sweatshirt with a hood on. Holy and, smokes! All right, listen to me. Um, let's have the rest of the story. I, I don't want to get, I don't, don't want this hanging. So obviously, you would stop your car, right? I was too scared. I was in the middle of nowhere, and and yeah, it was pitch black, <laughs> and I didn't understand why someone would come out of the woods and mm-hmm. run straight into my car when there's no traffic or anything. If they needed to cross the street, why would they wait until there was a car coming? Right. So I right. thought I should call the police, and I thought, what did I just see, and what was that? And I was like, what do I say to the police, that yeah. somebody darted out of the woods and ran into my car? So right. I drove home. Yeah. I was probably about... 30, 40 minutes and I was shaking. I was scared. I didn't know what had just happened to me. I got out to see if there was damage to my car and I thought about car police and I decided it had to have been an animal because there was nothing around there. Yeah, but six there feet no tall? Way. That's what it looked like out of the corner of my eye. So then the next day I looked in the papers and I looked through everything to see if anybody, you know, if there were any dead bodies in the road because that would have made the local news and there wasn't nothing. So I don't yeah, know if it was an something. animal. I don't know what All it right, was. Hold on. Let's, let's, Linda, what would you ask? Well, I would say that um, it's very common that when people spot a dog man and they're looking at it from and it's moving quickly, their first impression will often be that it's somebody with a hoodie or with um, a gray fur jacket Here. or something like that on until they can get a better look at it. That's exactly what it looked like, and it was really terrifying. It was running very fast, very fast. You know, like, and that's, that's why I thought they couldn't yep. have been a person. Because that's something else no that I hear. Yep, it, they, for some reason, I've got a whole chapter on this in my new book. Um, there are a certain number of them that seem to be very attracted to cars. They'll run straight into them. They'll run really? alongside them. They'll run right behind them. And it's very unlike normal animals, other than like farm dogs, you know, <laughs> that chase a car. But it seems like there's some other agenda, and it just terrifies people. And don't worry, you're not the only person. I've never had anybody um, really say that they just stopped when it was in the. All right, Lisa, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ha- hold on, hold on, both of you, ma'am, stop. hold it, hold it, both of you, hold on, okay? Okay. All right, good. We'll be back. Take a walk on the wild side of midnight. From the Kingdom of Nye, this is Midnight in the Desert with Art Bell. Please call the show at 1-952-225-5278. That's 1-952-CALL-ART. Linda Godfrey is here, and we are talking about creatures. And we've got a lady, Abby, on the phone, who was driving along at how many miles an hour, Abby, when this happened? Can you tell me? Yeah, I was going about 65. 55. Um, okay, so you were going good and fast. Yep. And this creature, six feet in size, smacks into the side of your car. That's yep. where we were. And, and Linda, that's incredible. And you're telling me, I don't want to say it's normal, but you've had other reports. Yeah, it happens fairly frequently. And, you know, it's just... Um, inexplicable as Weird. to why they would want to uh, take such a chance with themselves. Most wild animals will um, try and just go across the road and get away from you. There are also those who cross in front of the car almost as if they're sort of daring it to stop or right. playing a game with it, too. All right, caller, uh, here's a question for you. It comes from the computer, and it's a good one, too. Um, there would have been... Uh, if it was that heavy, it hit that hard, how much damage to the car was there, and was there any blood or hair on the car? No blood, no hair. I checked for blood because I was afraid that I'd hurt somebody. Obviously, yes. Um, no blood at all. 
Um, and the dent, there's a dis, you can see the dent. It's on the um, driver's side of the car because that's where it smacked into me. And you can definitely see the dent, but it wasn't a, wasn't as big as I thought it was going to be. It was, you know, just a slight. <laughs> well, it's in, it's a good indentation. You can see it, but mm-hmm. it wasn't like serious damage to the car or anything. Mm-hmm. Sure. But you can see I it where it people, hit. I have had people send me a package of hair. Um, I just have I have a package of hair sitting right and a uh, few feet away from me that um, I just haven't been able to get it identified anywhere. But it I was understand. taken off of the bumper. It was taken off the bumper of a similar incident. Okay. Well, um, Sa- Abby, thank you very much for the call and yeah, the story. That's it, just absolutely amazing. Um, whew. All right. Let's go to our next phone call, whoever that is. You're on the air. Hello. Hello. Cooler from Arizona? Yes, sir. Okay. First time caller ever. Um, thank you. I was going to ask Linda, and I give her courage for speaking about this subject because um, not many people are upright and people will think you're crazy. Oh, you know, around some people. Um, in Mexico, um, these creatures are known as naguales, the dogmen. Mm-hmm. And um, the, the last three months, I've been um, getting the oral stories from the family about their encounters with the naguales, whether right. it's my mm-hmm. aunt or an uncle. Um, how familiar are you with the Carlo Castaneda's works? Um, yeah, I've read some of those, and I, I am fairly familiar with them. Um, n- not everyone agrees that they're entirely accurate. I've I've had a lot of correspondence with um, some Central and South American um, people who, who study these things quite a bit. But um, did you have a special question about him or... Um, no, um, I, it was just that because he 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 talks about the 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 being able to become a creature, and you know I, I got mm-hmm. somewhat tied that to that, and just talking to my family and what they I've got them on camera talking in Spanish about what they've seen. Um, I you know just started doing my own research. I also came upon an author known as Daniel Britton Garrison from the 1800s. I don't know if you're familiar with his works as well. Um, no, that one doesn't ring a bell. It's interesting. Are there okay. legends uh, in Spanish uh, about humans that can become creatures? Oh yes, it's a uh, it's it's something that's like like she said. The tribes don't talk about it because um, it'll come to you. A lot of mm-hmm. it is uh, uh, sorcery, they say. Um, but um, a lot, like I said, I've had a lot of families. Uh, I've been interviewing family members about it. Some don't want to talk about it or they'll tell me it, but they don't want to do it on camera. But I have had some stories on camera and it's t- telling me about it in Spanish. And it, it goes pre pre Aztec times. So yeah, it's it's very, very widespread. I know another um I think Central American name, I can't remember exactly which country, but it's known as the Lobizon mm-hmm. is another is another term and um it's it's quite widespread. It's all, right. all over North and South America. <laughs> um, Duncan in New Zealand says, Art, uh, no, that's a wrong one. Gary in Czechoslovakia, my goodness. He says, I'm Hopi on my father's side. The spirit world is not paranormal. It is simple reality. It is the norm uh, that for some reason modern people simply cannot understand. I've been close to the spirits my whole life. It's just real. I don't disagree with that. You know, I'm. I mean, whether you take it from a certain religious view or from um, the many physicists that are coming up with actual plausible scientific explanations for the idea of other worlds, um, it's just not the everyday reality we perceive with our five senses. No, it isn't. And there are psychological explanations for a caller we had earlier. Um, on Skype, Trey, you're on the air. Hey, Art. Hey. Greetings from your STEAM group. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I was wondering if Linda had any plans on talking about the Mothman or any future stories she would do about that. I think we could probably encourage that. And I'd also love a whole show on that, by the way. Well, uh, we don't have a whole show left, but Linda, what about Mothman? A lot of people have a lot of interest, like this caller. Yes, yeah, that's that's a, a really well-known and, 
and popular topic, and, and it well should be, was very well studied by uh, the late, great John Keel, who sort of actually moved into the area for a while. And um, if you read his, he wrote The Mothman Prophecy mm-hmm. and has written about it quite a, in quite a few other places. And the interesting thing that um, not many people realize is that there was a lot more gr- going on there than these giant, strange, bird-like creatures. There were hundreds of UFO sightings that he personally investigated, and also men in black were appearing. <laughs> it was a whole combination of phenomena that took place in this area over those that, that uh, time frame. So I think it's a much more complex thing than just the Mothman, you know, the one, and sadly, the I guess the man who um, created that Mothman statue that's become sort of, or, or a sculpture that's become sort of iconic right down in downtown uh, Point Pleasant where they have the festival every year just passed away, um, I think, in the last week. But, uh, and maybe that's bringing that, um, the thought of that story to a lot of people's minds. But... Um, yeah, there are lots and lots of witnesses. There are many other materials. There are some really great um, photographic books that have been brought out recently about it. If you go looking, you can find a lot of interesting material. Um, did you have any special question about it or one certain I, Yeah, angle? actually. Uh, do you think this is something sort of spiritual or otherworldly, or do you think this is maybe an alien thing? I mean, what, what are your opinions on it? Well, I tend to go more toward the otherworldly thing than straight out um, other planet alien, just because all of these creatures, even when um, you know they're composed of different parts that shouldn't belong together, they're still recognizably in most cases um, earthly type animals. You know, it's a it's a mothman which has bird wings or um, you know a long beak. The giant birds are obviously versions of, of the smaller birds. The dog men resemble wolves, whereas I would think if they were coming from, you know, some far-off quadrant of the galaxy, they would look more unrecognizable. Not that we don't have those, too. You know, it's just that that's another subject. Um, you know, we do have greys and reptilians and all these other things that people describe seeing, but... Um, you know, they're, they're not quite the same thing in my book. How often? Uh, I've got a caller, thank you. Anything else? Uh, yes, uh, I was going to ask if she found this to be some sort of harbinger for things or if we moved away from that perception of it. All right. I, I do believe that um, many of these things seem to be perceived that way by um, by people, and, and I think we talked about that earlier in the show, but... Quite often, if you look, it, it seems like they they do show up just before something bad is going to happen. All right. How about this? I have heard you now mention any number of times a UFO report connected to uh, a nearby sighting of one of these things that we have talked about. Mm-hmm. So how mm-hmm. frequently does that connection get made? Um, fairly often. That was another thing that I've I've explored in my forthcoming book. I've been really, really looking at this, and it ties into the idea that a lot of people like to believe that the, especially Bigfoot, possibly Dogman, are actually aliens, and that they're either um, piloting the the uh, UFOs or that they're sort of left out as agents or pets, or you know, there are all sorts of different theories, but. Um, very, very often where you've got especially a flap area or a hot spot of sightings, mm-hmm. you will also find UFOs or spook lights and or other types of strange lights. And uh, it's kind of like the Skinwalker Ranch in Utah where they had the whole panorama of, of things happening. And I actually had a UFO experience myself in this very field I was talking about earlier where we've been finding the enigmatic footprints and having uh, deer carcasses mutilated and all that sort of thing. You know, I interviewed uh, Robert Bigelow. Really? Yes. I would like to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's a rare catch, uh, to be sure. Um, Bob and I are actually kind of friends. He's uh, an amazing guy. And what went on up at that ranch hmm. um, is nothing short of amazing. I actually think that what happened at that ranch closed 
a chapter uh, for Robert, and and he moved on. In he's now very much into uh, space, mm. he, putting hotels into space. He's got oh, he's got contracts with NASA. He's he's really turned a corner. But I I think with that ranch, he answered some questions, Linda. And I think the answers are amazing answers, and he just. I would like to know out. those answers. Did he did he share that with you? Um, not in every case. Uh, he shared with me the things, the impossible things that mm-hmm. happened there. He bought it mm-hmm. because those things were happening there, and right. then he documented them. I believe he found out what he wanted to know and moved mm-hmm. on. That's that's just my opinion. Well, that's. That's terrific. Well, and I do know that he had a lot of the scientific equipment and real oh, yes. scientists to throw at oh, it. Oh, yes. You yes, know, yes. So, I mean, it was studied as best as it possibly could have been. And, um, you know, I, I kind of envy that. I've, I've been working with my property owner out there in that field, and we are not funded that way. And And yet we still find ourselves coming to conclusions that we thought we never would have come to before. Mm-hmm. All right, on the phone, uh, you're on the air with uh, Linda. Hello? Yes, hello. Hello. Hi. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, Linda. Hi, Art. Hi. Um, I, I just want to tell you guys this story. It happened about 25 years ago with my children. My children would cross the road and go up in this guy's driveway and play all the time. Well, one evening... They came running in the house. They said, Mom, we heard a werewolf. I thought, well, now they've heard this weird dog, you know. And I went back outside, and I could hear it, too. And it wasn't like a regular dog. It was very, very odd. Well, Mm. I didn't know what to think about it. And, uh, you know, I was a typical housewife cooking and taking care of stuff. So I just went in the house, and uh, it was just when the sun was going down when this happened. And uh, I lived kind of in the woods area. But the, this guy had, like I say, a big, long concrete driveway that my kids would play on. Well, that evening, though, I want you to know, God will strike me dead. But it is the truth. Uh, we had a big picture window in the house, and that guy was a doctor that lived up on this hill, and he would come home late of the night. Well, I heard a strange sound, and I went to that picture window, and I looked out in my yard, and I could see the car lights of him coming up the road. And right there, I have never, I never, I always thought it was a joke. Werewolves were a joke. Mm-hmm. I saw this thing that had a huge back, and when it turned its head around, it had a snout at least a foot and a half long on it. Wow. Its body, its body was huge. I never, I have never seen anything like that. And you mentioned about UFOs. There were some weird lights that we'd seen just prior to me seeing this. It scared me so bad. I ran in the back room and locked the door. You said it made a sound. You said it made a sound. Can you describe that sound? Uh, well, sort of like a weird dog screaming, you know, sort of like that. I'm not really yeah. sure exactly how to describe it. Did it have and, uh, a relationship to that dog? Okay, hold on a sec. You... Linda, go ahead. Uh, were you saying, did it have a relationship to that doctor? I wasn't quite sure. Were you saying that the doc transformed into this, or it was just outside when the doctor was driving home? It was, or? It was Yeah, it was just outside when he was coming in. This guy oh. came in late at the evening because he was like an emergency room doctor, mm-hmm. and he worked late. And I, I had been staying up a little bit later. I guess this was close to midnight, maybe around that time. But I never expected anything. I just thought, well, there he comes. But the way the car drove into where the lights came into my yard, see, and I did not see any hands or arms, but I did see it move its body, and it had huge shoulder. I've never seen anything like that in my life, and it had to be at least maybe six foot tall maybe, but it's back was so large when it turned its head. Now, I want you to know, I thought all that stuff was a joke. 
and I never believed in anything like werewolves because I grew up, I'm an older lady, and I watched all those horror films years ago, and I just mm-hmm. thought that type of stuff was a joke. But they, when I saw that, and that freaked me out so much. Like I say, I mean, yeah, Well, that's, that's where the jokes yeah. stop. When you actually have an experience yeah. like that, the jokes stop, and you become exactly. different. Yeah. That's that's really true, and I have such a great respect for all the people who come forward and share their stories. And if I would love also if you'd like to send this one to me, and I don't mind giving my email, it's just lindagodfrey99 at gmail.com, or you can go to lindagodfrey.com and find the link um, to send me that. But I would really love to have that report. We've had actually a pretty good number of pretty good reports short very. the Italian tonight. Um, they've been very good. I, I agree, yeah, and uh, I mean, especially when I'm sitting there, I, I can't get over the um, the man talking about the head movement, and then I mm-hmm. just happen to have one out because it's very, very recent. But, um, yeah, I was afraid she was going to say that the doctor changed into no. the creature. But, it, you know, it's interesting because, again, I have gotten some transformation type of um, experiences, which I usually don't, and enough for me to kind of devote a whole chapter to them. Um, in my forthcoming book. They're, they're Can you relate happy. one of those? I mean, I, I mm-hmm. of course, that's stuff of the movies, but um, you have witnesses who have seen humans transform into something else? E- yes, either that or that they've seen what is obviously a um, human, part wolf, part human type of thing. Really? Um that is, yeah, really, 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 for instance, there was one one woman who, um, she and a boyfriend were walking through a Los Angeles park about dusk, and there weren't many people in the park at that time, and some there was a jogger coming toward them, and it ran right straight up to them, and she, she felt actually kind of nervous, like she was trying to make her boyfriend move farther out of the way from this jogger. There was something about him, and he got closer and it was a human body in a jogger suit, but with a complete wolf head. And it was breathing hard enough that she could see it wasn't like a mask or, a, you know, a rubber over the head type of werewolf costume. Yes. And it just looked at them and then leaped completely over a park bench and ran down to where there was, to where there was sort of a, a tunnel um, under this bridge sort of thing. Okay, for a lady who started out the show by saying werewolves aren't real, <laughs> you know, it seems to me like you're pinning down werewolves as being real. If I saw a human transform into a wolf-like creature, particularly a really big one, big teeth, maybe red eyes, <laughs> it's a werewolf. And if it isn't a werewolf, not sure I want to know what it is. Either way, I don't want to know. We'll be back. speed of light in the darkness. This is Midnight in the Desert with Art Bell. Now, here's Art. Here I am, and Linda Godfrey is my guest. Our landline number, area code 952-225-5278. Skype at MITD51 or internationally MITD55. And uh, here, Linda, is a description from somebody in Minnesota of what they claim was a sound of a werewolf. At first, it sounded like a woman coughing, then turned into gagging and transmuted into a dog-like howling and very loud, horrifying howl. Couldn't sleep right for months from Minnesota. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I've also, I have to say, I've also heard big screams described the same way as that. I have, and I, I like to ask people if they actually saw the creature making the sound because that's the only way to really relate it to it. And several times when people have actually observed it making the sound, what they've described is more like 
a variably pitched growl, kind of like those old-fashioned. Remember when everybody had a cappuccino maker? Yeah. And it would kind of be this up and down sound like, right? Sure, sure, I mean, sure. Like an octave in between, only really chilling in a, in a much lower and, and higher octave. A uh, very scary thing that sounded like nothing I'd ever heard. And I I had very unrelated people. This was completely unpublished, and they would make the exact same sound for me. Somewhere I have one recorded. But, um, yeah. it. But yet, I, you don't know. If you don't really see the creature, that creature making that sound, um, unfortunately, you can't say for sure. Yeah. You know what? I, that sound, as described, I don't want to see that creature. Not me. <laughs> on Skype, you're on the air. Oh, Matthew? Art Bell, praise the Lord, hallelujah. <laughs> I finally got through. Yes. Now, this woman is a very good guest, but I have to say that West Virginia has been a state since 1861, and Mothman is not from Virginia. Wait a minute. West Virginia? Yes, uh, West Virginia. And then Virginia? Yes, uh, West Virginia has been a state since 1861. Okay. Point Pleasant is in West Virginia, not Virginia. Okay. Right. If if I thought that I said West Virginia, I may have misspoken. I'm, I apologize if I did, but that's, I do. But you're that's fine. entirely correct, Thanks. of course. But and, I have maybe to say, werewolves stop. are very real, Mr. Bell. They are satanic influences, and these. The werewolf call sounds like the cry of the unborn baby whose blood these people have been baptized in and the mothers who never got to hold their baby. They are witches. Are they? Um, you, you know, I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Um, are you related to uh, anybody who used to call this show called J.C.? I am his spiritual son, Mr. Bell. No, I thought you might be. Uh, blood tells. That's all I can say. Blood tells. Well, I'll take my answer off the air. Thank you very much. I don't know what your question is. Yeah, I think it was more of a statement. I, I didn't know <laughs> your question. Yeah, exactly. I wasn't there myself. <laughs> <laughs> I know that voice. I swear to God. <laughs> Even if Jay-Z has passed to the great beyond, uh, that caller, um, that caller's got the blood in him. Uh, do a script. Very quick Skype call. Hello, Tongue. Nathan, you're on the air. Hi. Uh, hey, Art. Hey. Hey, I'm sorry. Let me just uh, turn this off. Yes, yeah, so always do that, please. Yeah, you have, you have. I was on hold on the. The phone infamous there. turn okay. down hey, your device. Uh, I'm a huge fan, Art. Thank, Thank you, you so much for taking the call. Sure. Um, uh, I grew up, Art. Uh, Linda, hello too. Uh, it's a great Hi. show. It's great stuff. Um. <laughs> I grew up in uh, Bordentown, New Jersey, really old town uh, on the Delaware River, um, where Joseph Bonaparte, uh, one of the original uh, witnesses to the Jersey Devil, he had an estate there. Uh, mm-hmm. He also had this weird, like, cave structure on the river called the Rock Gardens in the town I grew up in. And um, uh, I'll I'll make this short, Linda. Uh, I was just curious what your uh, what your you know thoughts or theories on the Jersey Devil were. And um, mm-hmm. also, uh, one of the questions I had had already been answered about uh, cryptids appearing at the same time as UFO sightings. Um, some in southeastern PA I've read about where there's those strange, like, deer with the bent back legs being seen in conjunction with UFOs. Um, and that's really interesting, but mm-hmm. I, um, that question obviously already been brought up. And uh, <laughs> All right, we have this real quick break we have to do, so what we'll do is do it, and we'll come back, and we'll talk about the Jersey Devil a little bit. You know, it seems like everybody, or everywhere, I should say, has some kind of devil or monster connected to it. Hi, I'm Asia Bell, and it's very late, so I'm sleeping now, but you're awake, so call my daddy, because he's awake too. The number is 
1952-225-5278. That's 1952-CALL-ART. <laughs> and that's Asia. Um, all right, Linda, welcome back. I want to remind everybody, I have found Madman Markham. He'll be here tomorrow night. Um, Linda, it's great to have you back. And, um, boy, we've been through a lot tonight, uh, a lot of really good calls. Mm-hmm. I'm very, uh, great. Mm-hmm. very impressed uh, with everybody. Uh, let's you. let's go to Nathan. Nathan, you're on with uh, with Linda. Hi. Uh, hey, thanks for having me back on. All right. <laughs> okay, you're a li- breaking up a little bit, so. Okay, I'm sorry. That's that's all right. Just get good and close to whatever your device is. Okay, uh, it's this tablet here. Okay, well, you find the okay. little hole in the tablet, and you're talking to Oh, I'm sorry, that. sorry. Right. Is that better? Much better, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, again, thank you again so much for having me, Art. Uh, I've been obsessed with the Jersey Devil since I've been a kid, obviously, growing up. Right. Uh, in the town that he'd been spotted in, and that's a very interesting uh, thing for me. I'd love to hear what Linda has to say, but also, just out of curiosity, I'm wondering why they're... Uh, aren't more cat uh, if there are cat creatures or or uh you know more uh cat like creature sightings um that'd be really interesting to hear i know there's a lot of dog creatures and whatnot um but uh but yeah um i'll take i'll take my question off the air and uh thanks again for having me art sure you um, you bet thanks. a shout out to bordentown my dad john who i experienced lost time with and uh turned me on to your show right. and uh my uncle bob and uh you know, keep it weird, New Jersey. I love you so much, Art. You're you're Thank a you. huge, huge influence in my life. It's so great to hear you back on the air. Thank you, my friend. All right, well, there you have it, the Jersey Devil. I have no idea what is the Jersey Devil anyway. The Jersey Devil is um, it's actually a, a really famous cryptid, although it's very hard to pin down exactly what it looks like, and it's kind of confusing because it's supposed to have started with. Um, this old legend dating back to 1735 where a woman had uh, one too many children and cursed it, and it turned out to be a demon that ate family and ran into the woods. That's one version. There are different versions. And then it surfaced again, not until almost 200 years later, in 1909, went into um, Haddon Heights uh, and 30 different New Jersey communities. And in Haddon Heights, all the passengers on a city trolley saw the creature at the same time. Policemen saw it. The, the fire departments were shooting it with water hoses. And it was said to look kind of like a kangaroo with wings, and it would uh, fly up onto houses and leave footprints shaped like horses' hoofs. So it was this really, really weird thing, and not so much doing destruction um, as, well, it Pets and farm animals would go missing, basically, was what happened. And then it sort of went away again. Uh, Supposedly, it still shows up now and then. Um, I know people from the area who uh, study it at great depth, and they say there are still some sightings of it. But um, I don't know if the gentleman also wanted me to address the cat-like creatures, because that is something that's much lesser known, but uh, does happen. And... Um, I talked about that in the Real Wolfman book. I started getting reports, especially out of California, out of something that I call the Doberman lynx because it seemed to be, and especially seen around the canyons around L.A. for some reason, um, where it looks kind of like um, part bipedal lion combined with with, um, these high ear tufts and some of the facial features that remind people more of um, like a Doberman, which is really strange, and I'm not sure what to make of it. I don't know if it's just some strange special dog breed that has cropped up there. Um, But then you go into the southern states, and there's a very widespread legend of something called the Wampus Cat, which is um, something like, again, a mountain lion walking upright that has a blood-chilling yowl and, and screams, and, again, goes back to a very ancient legend that may or may not be connected with modern-day science. The only cat I ever saw, Linda, I drove for 10 years between here and Las Vegas. One night coming down the mountain on the Vegas side, uh, this thing walked across the street. It was a mountain lion, I'm sure of it, mm-hmm. pretty sure of it. It was gigantic. And I'm telling you, Linda, 
it covered both lanes. It, there, it, you know, it was only two lane, one lane mm-hmm. going each direction. And I slammed the brakes. I was doing 70. <laughs> wow. Uh, slammed the brakes on, uh, went every way but sideways, and I missed the thing, thank God. But it scared the poop out of me. I don't blame you. Yeah, they're scary. I'm much more afraid of those than Bigfoot or Dogman. When I say big, I, it covered both lanes. It was that wow. big. I, wa- I wasn't going to miss it unless it moved enough, and it did, thank God. Yikes. Yeah, yikes, yikes is right. All right, uh, let's go here to the telephone, and I think Florida. Hello. Hi. Uh, I want to ask your guest if she's familiar with the story. I've seen several stories this summer about uh, sightings in the Milwaukee area of some sort of big cat. One story I'm reading right now from July says, Milwaukee's Beast, the mysterious mountain lion terrifying Wisconsin. Can you give us an update on what the latest on that is? And then second question, have you ever, yeah, I know you did a book on ghosts. Have you ever seen a ghost? And what is your feeling about the credibility of EVP recordings as evidence? Do you think that's credible or not? Okay, that's quite a wide range. But, it is. <laughs> but, but I can start you off. Yeah, definitely I've been following the, the mountain lion very closely because um, I've been gearing up for a very big blog post. I, I did a preliminary blog post. If you go to lindagodfrey.com and go back just a couple um, of, of spaces in, in the blogs, you'll find one on that um, Milwaukee mountain lion and some previous ones that were in the area. I happen to live right smack in the pathway. My husband was stalked and almost attacked two years ago in October by a mountain lion that he then saw the next day, and two of our neighbors saw it too. They come from the Black Hills. They go through Minnesota. They come down through southeastern Wisconsin, and um, that's how one ended up in Chicago five years ago that was ended up being shot. And that same one had been identified by DNA as being within five miles of my house. So I like to keep tabs on these. I took a walk in the Kettle Moraine with some friends last winter uh, in uh, February looking for um, some Bigfoot signs, and instead we saw hundreds and hundreds of mountain lion tracks following us in and crossing as we came back out. So these things are around, and I've got a huge documentation of them all around the central area of Wisconsin. So um, they're here. They're on the move. These are real animals, and... Um, I'm just hoping that there isn't any sort of tragic um, accident before our uh, it will be admitted that they actually are here because they're one of these creatures that the authorities do not like to admit is here. It costs them a lot of money um, to have to do fulfill certain things in the law to take care of them if that happens. That's one, one big reason. All right. He wants you to jump then to ghosts and EVPs as proof. I have seen ghosts in... Shockingly enough, it was when I was looking for them. Um, I wrote, I, I co-authored Weird Wisconsin and authored uh, Weird Michigan with the Barnes & Noble Weird U.S. series. So one of the things that I had to do was go to many of the very known, very haunted sites in both states. And in each state, I saw one ghost in the place where it was supposed to be. And they were both just uh, surprise visits. The host had no chance to send anything up. It was both, both times it was in daytime, and they were very, both times I was so shocked that I had a camera in my hands with a strap around my neck, and I never got the camera up in time to actually take the picture of a ghost. Um, it would take me quite a bit of time to tell you both stories, but um, they are in the Weird Wisconsin and Weird Michigan books um and okay you know I, anything about evps evps scare me even more than mountain lions <laughs> <laughs> and i've heard some really good ones i you know i i don't know for sure what they are but i think there's some credence to the idea that there are things floating in some other reality i i'm not sure if they're from actual dead people or if they are oh. other entities i don't know that, that are pretending that are pretending to be dead people but what i've heard and i've heard some really creepy ones from um people at different conferences uh they're they're usually really really frightening and scary the things that these things are saying and if anything ever seemed demonic to me it's evp Okay. James on uh, Skype. Hello there. You're on the air with uh, Linda Godfrey. Hello, Art and Linda. I just wondered Hi, if uh, Linda had ever heard the uh, story of the Wooly Burger in Ohio, central Ohio. 
the Wooly Bear. Wooly um, Burger. Uh, oh, burger? Wooly, wooly, yeah. Wooly Burger? Yeah. It, um, does that come with the, fries or? No, it's the, it's the uh, last name of the gentleman that, uh, it's a werewolf story. Okay. And uh, there was a gentleman that, uh, there's a town called Darbydale. A lot of people will call it a uh, a uh, Bigfoot, but it's not because they don't know. Anyways, mm-hmm. the remnants of his home, which is brought from Eastern Europe, uh, you can still see a couple uh, uh, pylons that are in mm-hmm. the, the creek. It's called Hell's Branch. Hmm. And what ended up happening was um, a bunch of the people started dying. Well, they figured it out that it was Willy Burger. And uh, they destroyed his home, so most of the homes along the river have parts of his old castle. So you're telling me, you're, okay, you're telling me this is a guy named Willy Burger. Yeah. Right, yeah. okay. And yeah. he transformed into what? Into a werewolf. Into Anyways, a werewolf so, and so killed they, people. Yeah, and so he he was killed. They shoved a rock in his mouth, and there's a cemetery mm-hmm. called Wooly Burger Cemetery after that. It's not Wooly, it's Wooly. Wooly, like I'm sorry. Wooly right, what, Wooly. Is yeah. near, what is that near? Do you mind my asking? Yeah, it's, what it's that by is? the town Darbydale, in Columbus, Dar- or uh, outside of Columbus, Ohio. I grew oh, up there. Columbus. That's why I know this. Oh, yep. okay. Near Columbus. Okay. I've had yeah. a long, long standing um, werewolf habitat or, or wolfman habitation situation going on not too far from Columbus, and I found quite a few sightings in Columbus. And I'll also say that um, Wisconsin has the same sort of historic um, background to to what they called the war wolf or, or we now call werewolves, where you have these German immigrants who bring these cultural tales and cultural beliefs with them, and they seem to manifest here as well as they did there. Exactly. It's lycanthropy. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, that's what I'm saying. It, it, anyways, he still exists. I have an experience with him that I talk about sometimes, but it's a long story, and I'm sure you'd be bored with it. But, uh, Please email it anyways, to me. I would huh? love to see it. No, she's Please not going to be so bored. That. Email it to her. and uh, It will your, not bore me. <laughs> your email is, again? LindaGodfrey99 at gmail.com. Or you can just go, go to lindagodfrey.com. All right. And, Anyways, Bell Gab uh, Roswell's art. God bless. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yo, Bell Gab. Um, okay, let's go here to, I think, Kentucky on the phone. You're on the air. Mr. Bell? Yes. This is AR from your biggest and most loyal online community into infinity. My goodness. Anyway. Well, welcome. Hello. I wanted to, I got a Bigfoot story from years ago, but I'd rather ask a question. Okay. That's okay. It is? People talk about why there is no bodies for Bigfoot or the dog men. That's right. I consider the thought that possibly they're intelligent enough that they don't leave bodies behind to be found. They either bury them. Before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hide them. Possibly eat them. I just wonder what the guests thought about that possibility or theory. Well, I've I've heard that suggested before, and there's another thing, too, uh, concerning the dogmen. Now, let's say you've got a dead Bigfoot. You find that lying there, this eight, nine-foot-tall, like thing, and you know you've got something really weird. You find a giant dogman of the type that's usually called into me, and you would probably just say, wow, that's a really weird, kind of weird-looking big dead wolf. You know, you wouldn't think as much of it. I do believe that these things are seen and, and may be seen and people don't know what they have. With the Bigfoot, um, people do believe, I've often heard it said that they think they probably take them and bury them or um, just, you know, remove them. Mm-hmm. My Native American friends say they go back to their world um, before or as they, you know, if, if they're going to expire, that's where they go and do it. And that's why we don't find the bodies from the Bigfoot. Um, I don't know how to prove either one, but I think... I think, uh, you know, if you're going along with the partly physical, partly but fully physical, partly but fully otherworldly creature, well, then it makes great sense that they would um, go to some lengths to remove themselves. And then other people well, also, I, also say, pardon? I was going to say, from what I saw, it was purely physical. But this thing was definitely physical, but it was as solid as the pair I'm right. in. But right. They, uh, they, and that's I was going to say, anyone that goes in... Right. 
anyone, anyone that goes into the woods knows you won't find a complete body. You'll find bones or sure. scraps of fur. Or sure. You're not going to find a complete Apex skeleton predators. of anything. All right. No, especially not apex predators. You you just don't find, you know, dead bears or things like that lying around. Definitely not. All right. We'll squeeze one more in. Chris on uh, Skype. Hey, how you doing, Art? Fine. Um, all right, so this is a weird question. My buddy was in Iraq about mm, 10 years ago, something like that. He always tells a story about he he thinks he saw a werewolf, but this is definitely a female werewolf, right? Okay. Um, how he knows this, it sounds gross. I don't know how to describe it in a better way, but he rescues dogs. Okay. And some of them aren't neutered. So they that time of the month happens. Right. He said that this werewolf, it, it had like the female... Uh, female attributes. It had boobs, <laughs> if I can say that. Um, and it also it smelled. It smelled like that time of the month yeah. for a werewolf. Yeah. I don't know how to explain that in the right way, but he says he knows. It was on the side of the road, and they stopped on the side of the road, and it, it crossed like right in front of them. They were it was, they were in a truck or something. Yes. And they got out of the the, the car, and it. it turned around and looked at them, came back, I'm saying, or he's saying, three feet away, this thing comes up to him, and he, it's, it stinks, like, so bad, he can't even, you know, he, he's like, the only thing I could describe is a dirty dog, like, yeah. that he would get from a pound. I've got it, it listen, it our show, it. our show is ending here, I, yeah, but hate that's, to rush him. yeah, my question is, has, what is this smell like, um, you described a dirty dog, right? I said that earlier on the program, too. A dirty dirty dog need, in need of a bath, bad dog urine, that, that almost, whole... Almost everybody knows what that smell is like. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. All right, Linda. Just, man, what a great show. Thank you very much. Uh, you have a oh, website, right? Yes, lindagodfrey.com. That's my WordPress blog, and there's a page there with frequently asked questions, my book list, um, all kinds of things. All right. Well, thank you for the great education on things that um, I'd rather not meet up with, frankly, but it's been a great show. Thank you. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. You have a good night. Take care. What, a, what an honor to have you on. All right. That's it for this night. And again, uh, you might want to pass the word. I've found Madman. He'll be with us uh, for some period of time tomorrow night. I don't know. Madman is uh, one of the world's unique individuals. Madman Markham. Till then, all the uh, time zones around the earth, good night. Have a wonderful night. See you tomorrow.